Hello, everyone. So if, you have, if there's any children here in the congregation today, uh, you are released to attend Sunday school where there's going to be some amazing lessons and activities for you uh, while we're doing this sermon today. And well, first of all, good morning, Willow Baptist Church. All praise be to God. And today, I have something a little special for you guys. I actually have a, have a PowerPoint because, uh, because we're going to be looking at a, lot of, at a lot of scriptures, and I wanted to make sure that you guys can actually see what I mean. Uh, for those of you that remember a few years ago, one of my, one of my favorite hobbies, well, it, and even to this day, one of my favorite hobbies when it comes to uh, preaching the Word of God is I love to blow people's minds. And in a good way, basically, I want people to understand it, to have an, an like a, a knowledge and an understanding of the scriptures in a way they probably didn't have before. You know, I love revealing uh, Christ in the Old Testament or just things, passages, and even, even uh, entire stories where like, you may have known it, you may have read it a million times. And here's the thing, you guys probably have realized this by now. English, like we, we use an English translation. I also come from a Hispanic church. So any language that is not the original, for example, for the Old Testament Hebrew or for the New Testament Greek, it really doesn't do it justice. That's just the reality of it. So much gets lost in translation and therefore I believe it's important. And those of you that enjoy studying the scriptures can affirm this with me, that when you are studying the scriptures, whether it's Old or New Testament, you, there is a richness in the original language. And when you understand that, when you come to that understanding, not only does it blow your mind, which I wanna do with you guys today, but you even begin to appreciate God's word even more. And there is so much revealed even about God's nature and his character that you may have, ne may have never seen before. Something that has gone way over your head, but now has been revealed. So today's passage, uh, you can also turn your Bibles here, but this is um, the New King James Version, which is the version that you may have noticed that I use for a lot of my sermons. Uh, some people like to use NIV or the ESV. But very simply here, I'm gonna read it here just so I don't have to keep turning back. Just a bit of the context. Uh, the book of Ezekiel isn't read too often now in the church, let's be honest. A lot of people tend to neglect the Old Testament. But there is a link here with the character of God and what he has done for us and, and the Old Testament. So the context of this, a lot, like a lot of the prophets of the Old Testament, Ezekiel was proclaiming, like it was God through Ezekiel proclaiming judgment against the people of Israel for their sins. For those that don't know the historical context of this, Ezekiel was one of the captives, the Jewish captives taken into Babylon because of the sin of the people. God had sent the prophets, he had warned them through Isaiah, for example, and, and very shortly before the Babylonian conquest through the prophet Jeremiah, warning them of incoming disaster if they did not repent. And because the majority did not, the consequences came. Babylon uh, conquered the nation of Israel, Israel and Judah. Like the, the, they conquered the Jewish people, they destroyed the temple, and they took most of the people into captivity, those that didn't die, really. But there was a remnant. There were people who did repent. There were those who did heed the word of the Lord, whether it was before or afterwards, they turned their hearts to God. And so this is a very interesting passage that I'm gonna tell you right now, the English does not do it justice, just so you're not disappointed later. And you'll notice I put a specific word in bold, and, and this is gonna make sense in a little bit. Let us read it together. So basically, again, just for the context, uh, God is sending this angelic figure, and Ezekiel is seeing this, and so the Lord said to him, to this angelic figure, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, so that they are in the land of Israel, and put a mark, that's what I've emphasized, a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry, another version says who grieve over all the abominations that are done within it. All right, interesting enough. So, okay, so this is an angelic figure and God is commanding him to put a mark on specific people not on everybody and not randomly, only to those who are grieving because of sin. Really, those who are repenting. So God is sealing or marking these people. Okay, pretty interesting so far. And that's the thing, in a lot of other Bible translations, like here it says mark, another translation may say sign or a signal or some other translation. I don't know what, what versions you guys use. But I'm telling you right now, that really the English does not do it justice. And so you guys may remember from the last time I preached that I strongly recommend that if you're reading the Old Testament, 
to use this version, you can find it on BibleGateway.com. It's called the Orthodox Jewish Bible, which shows you basically whatever word cannot be perfectly translated into English, it actually sticks with the original Hebrew. So even, uh, even the name Ezekiel is uh, translated as Yetzekiel. And here, uh, let me just read it for you guys here very quickly. It says, and Hashem, which is uh, one, of the, one of the titles for God, Hashem said unto him, to this angel, go through the midst of the ear, through the midst of Yerushalayim, and put a tav, you remember that? In the English it says, he commands this angel to put a mark on the foreheads of those who are repenting of their sins, who are grieving over the abominations of the city. In the Hebrew, the word for mark is tav. Hey, you guys, uh, how many of you, does anybody here know Hebrew by any chance? One person, I, I knew you were gonna raise your hand, Glenn. <laughs> That's something, for those, that you've, those of you that don't know, tav is actually the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so I remember reading this in the Orthodox Jewish Bible and I was like, oh, that's interesting. So there's a mark and it's a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so I quickly went on to Google Images and I typed in Hebrew letter Tav, clicked enter. And this is what I saw. So uh, you may have seen this if you guys have um, you know, read anything in Hebrew, you're like, oh, I've seen this. It kind of almost resembles a letter N, but I didn't really see anything really interesting about this. I'm like, why would God put this sign, well, assign this angel to put this sign upon the heads of those who are repenting in Jerusalem? Because we know God is, God is setting these people apart. God is saying there is, there is a difference between those who have continued in their abominations, who brought the disaster in the first place, but I'm setting these people, I'm, signing, I'm putting a sign, a mark on these people who have turned from their wicked ways and come to me. And then I, th and I realized something, hold on a second. This is modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew, it doesn't even have the exact same uh, structure as ancient Hebrew, the Hebrew that would have been used during the time of Ezekiel. Roughly, Ezekiel would have lived about 600 years before Jesus. And so, you know, once again, right, right, right back to the drawing board, I wanted to look at uh, proto, basically what is known as paleo Hebrew. So the Hebrew that was used uh, before the time of Christ. And so remember, God is setting these people apart because of their repentance. And so he's putting a sign on them to mark that these people have, been now, have now been redeemed by God because of the change in their heart. Are you guys ready to have your minds blown? In ancient Hebrew, when God commanded this angel to mark these people 600 years before Christ, this is what God put on their foreheads. 600 years before Christ. There we go, there we go. I was waiting for a wow or a whoa. <laughs> that, that, that was the reaction I had. Is, that is amazing. Okay, but what does, that have, what does this have to do with us exactly? Because, okay, we, have, we may have heard verses like this. So how many of you have heard this verse from Ephesians? It says this very clearly. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Another translation says, for those of you who are marked, you are marked by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. And you see, for example, in the book of Revelation, I didn't put this verse up in the, in the PowerPoint, but in the book of Revelation, everyone ultimately, before, before they stand before the throne of God for judgment, everyone is marked. Now, those of you that have read Revelation chapter 13, you may have heard of the mark of the beast. How many of you have heard that term before? Mark of the beast, you know, the 666. And people have many theories about what that looks like, how it's gonna manifest, if it's gonna be, you know, a microchip or a tattoo. And we can debate that all day long. But a lot of people in, trying to, in focusing so much on this mark of the beast, they forget that there is another mark. There is another seal that is given but not to those who worship the beast, those who worship the Antichrist, but to those who are loyal to God. The mark or the seal of the lamb is upon the foreheads of these people anointed by God. So when people stand before the throne of God, everyone is marked. But the question is, what are they marked with? Or who truly has marked them? And by the way, I have my own theory about the mark of the beast it may very well manifest in some physical way, maybe, maybe a microchip or a tattoo when the time comes, but truly the true mark of the beast will be submission to Satan. 
it will be a complete rejection of God. And we see this all the way in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God actually commands the people of Israel to have his law, his mitzvot, on their, on their right hands and in their minds, on their foreheads, which is the same language that is used by John in Revelation chapter 13. So having the seal of God means to submit to him and therefore to have the mark of the beast, who is the Antichrist, who is Satan, basically, is to submit yourself to the kingdom of darkness and to completely reject God. How that will manifest physically, we are yet to find out. But the point is that everyone is sealed. So therefore, you who are even here in this church right now, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you have already been sealed. God's Holy Spirit has already sealed you for the day of redemption. You don't have to have a, like a, physical, like a, a cross like tattoo on your forehead or, or on your hand or anything like that. It is a spiritual mark, but it is on you. It is a spiritual reality. And here's the thing, this is something, the reason why I even got interested in this uh, anyways after all is that, um, uh, is that this. How many of you have heard the story of John Wesley? He was the founder of the Methodist uh, denomination within Christianity. And he began his life as an Anglican priest. But he was a very, um, he was very strict with himself. He even founded this, uh, this club. He called, they called themselves the Holy Club. Very humble, eh? <laughs> and, and they were always, yeah, we're always going to self-examine. We're going to make sure we're not sinning. We're going to make sure that we follow God's law to the T. But then he was sent on a mission by ship all the way to the United States. Well, at the time, they were just the 13 colonies. The United States was not its own country yet. But along the way on the ship, there was a storm right in the middle of the Atlantic. And he begins to panic. And just like anybody else in that situation, you, know, you can't turn back, you're in the middle of the ocean, there's a huge storm, there's a good chance the boat might sink. Any reasonable person is gonna freak out, right? So Wesley was astonished that in the midst of this storm, he could hear in a separate compartment of the ship, he could hear people singing. And so he takes a peek, and it's this group from Bohemia, which is modern day uh, Czech Republic, called the Moravians. And in the midst of the storm, in the midst of this, you know, of, of tribulation, literally, and their lives are at stake, they are singing praises to God. Almost resembling the story from Acts 16 when Paul and Silas were in jail and they were in the midst of their sufferings, they were giving thanks and praising God and the other prisoners were listening to them. But Wesley sees this and he says, how can these people be so calm and even joyful? They're rejoicing even in the midst of these circumstances. How can they do that? But I can't. Why do they seem to have this peace in their hearts that I don't share? I'm panicking, I'm freaking out like any reasonable person, but there is a peace that surpasses all understanding that is upon this group of people. And luckily enough, everybody survived. You know, they all made it, they all made it to shore, to the 13 colonies. And you know, the thought never left Wesley's mind. He couldn't stop thinking about those group of people that were singing and rejoicing and at peace, even in the midst of a storm. And he becomes friends with one of the, one of the Moravians. He happened to be from the Netherlands. He was a Dutch Christian. And he asked this very special question to, to John Wesley. He says, does the Holy Spirit bear witness in your heart? And Wesley, even knowing the scriptures, He's like, okay, I know, I know what you're asking me comes from, this, from, comes from the Bible, but, but I don't understand your question. What do you mean that he bears a witness in my heart? He simplifies it. Herr Wesley, do you know that you are saved? In other words, do you know, like you know, you know this, you know for God's love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But for you on a personal level, do you know that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, died and rose again for your salvation? And because of him, you are saved. Had you died on that ship, had the, had the ship gone down like the Titanic basically, and you had to stand before God, would you be saved? And Wesley hesitated. He wanted to say yes because he knew the scriptures, he knew about God's promises, but he hesitated. He was like, uh, uh, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, I know I'm saved. And he says, no, Herr Wesley, you hesitate. You cannot hesitate when your soul is at stake. 
And he says, I don't understand why these people were singing. You know why those people were singing? Because they had assurance of their salvation. They knew if that ship were to go down, they would be with the Lord, but they also trusted that God would lead them safely to the place where God had instructed them to go. These Moravians, they weren't on vacation. This group of Moravians from from the Czech Republic, they had come to the American colonies to evangelize, to tell, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And so they knew, you know, God has set us apart for this mission, for such a time as this, and he will see us through. But even if he does not, even if if we have to die here in the middle of the Atlantic, we have full assurance that we will be in the arms of our Savior. Almost very similar to the response from, uh, from uh, uh, Daniel's three friends. You remember the story of the furnace? Where they said, you, you, know, you must bow or else you're going to be put in the furnace. And they said, we know that our God is mighty to save and he can deliver us from your hand. But even if he does not, know King Nebuchadnezzar that we will never bow to any other God other than Yahweh. It's the same attitude. They, they had full confidence in who, and, you know, in who God was and the relationship they had to him. Wesley did not share that. It was until much later that he hears, I believe it's from 1 John, where, he, where it says that, you know, but if we walk in the light, just as how he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, covers us and delivers us from all sin. And Wesley describes in his journals that suddenly I felt like a warmness in my heart and I truly knew, for the first time, I knew that Christ was my Savior. So he had a conversion experience where the Holy Spirit finally convicted his heart that yes, by placing his faith and trust in Jesus alone and not in his holy club, you know, how often he self-examined himself, how often he read the Bible or did Bible studies or gave alms to the poor, you can be sure of your salvation, my friends, not because of you, Oftentimes when people preach a message of being assured of your salvation, people become uncomfortable and they hesitate. And they're like, how can you say such a thing? Isn't that a very arrogant attitude to have? Oh yeah, I'm going to have it. Isn't that, isn't that arrogant? It is arrogant if the reason behind your assurance is yourself. If, the re- if you say, oh, because I'm a good person, because I do this, I do that, you know, I go to church, I tithe, I, you know, I do all these rituals, I pray, I give everything to the poor. Even 1 Corinthians 13 tells us if you can do all these things but you have not love, you are nothing. If your salvation is reliant on you, if you're sure of your salvation because of you know, a checklist that you've done, then yes, that is arrogance. And I'm gonna say it, it's a very foolish thing to do because the scripture tells us that our righteousness before God are like filthy rags in comparison to the holy standard of God. But what about if, your, if the assurance of your salvation doesn't depend on you? What about if it depends on someone that is much greater than you? Someone like, oh, I don't know, maybe God? What if it is God who justifies the ungodly? The one who gives by his grace salvation to all who believe in him. The reason why I preach that yes, you can be sure of your salvation, but it is not dependent on you. I take it straight from John. Both in John in his gospel and in his epistle repeats the same message. Check this out. So uh, you may have heard this before, uh, Romans chapter eight, verse one. This is a, just to give a little bit of context. It says here that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We just did a, a series on the book of Romans. This may sound familiar. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who seals us. He is the one putting that mark on us because of what Jesus Christ has done. And John, in John 20, 31, he says this, but these are written. So he's saying, this is the reason why I even wrote this gospel in the first place, the whole story of Jesus. And in the beginning was the word that he died and that he rose. Why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, okay? And that by believing, you may have life in his name. He repeats this in his epistle in 1 John 5, 13. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So yes, my friends, 
You can be sure of your salvation. You can have full confidence because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. It is really that simple. So this mark that God has placed on our hearts, that he's placed on you, is because of this. There is therefore now no condemnation. And here's the thing, often when we read this verse, we think about, oh, condemnation from others. Condemnation even from Satan himself, which is true. How many of you know that Satan is not his name? It's a title. Satan means the adversary or the accuser. It's almost like, like, like in a court of law, you have like the, the prosecutor basically. But the Bible says that even though we have an accuser, we have, a, we have someone that is accusing us before the Father, we also have an advocate who, who he can sympathize with our weaknesses because he too lived just like us. He was like us in every way except without sin. And because he is without sin, if my confidence is in him, then I can be assured of my right standing with God. Because I stand before the Father, not with my own works, I stand before the Father dressed in the righteousness of his Son. That is what assures me of my salvation. It was Martin Luther who said, look, when I look at myself, I look at my works, everything that I have done, I have no reason to believe that I can be saved. That's what I was warning you guys about before. If someone comes to you and says that they know they're going to heaven because they're a good person, they are gravely mistaken. But Luther continues, he says, when I look upon myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look upon Jesus Christ and I see what he's done for me, that he has clothed me with his righteousness by grace through faith, I now see no reason to doubt my salvation. I don't see a reason how I can be lost if God the Son is with me. If he is my advocate before the Father, I can have full assurance because of what he did for me. And he preached to the churches there in Germany. He says, when the accuser comes to you and he says that you deserve judgment because of your sins, because of your transgressions, he said, tell him this. I know I deserve judgment, but what of it? Because I know of one who suffered on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And because he lives, I will live also. And where he is, I will be also. Dear church, we can stand firm in our salvation, not because of us, but very simply because of the promises of God. There is no, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is not, there is no condemnation from the world. There is no condemnation from the enemy. And there is no condemnation from yourself. How often are we, as believers, our own worst enemy? There are times when Satan can just sit back and relax because we're, we're doing all the work for him. We are the ones in self-condemnation and that, 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 that barrier between us and God is not even the devil or sin anymore. It's our own distrust, it's our, own, it's our trust in our own righteousness, and if you're someone like John Wesley, you cannot have confidence in your own salvation. You're stuck in this, in this, this position of identity where you are just, you belong to yourself or you belong to the world, you belong to your own insecurities, you're safe there for some reason, but you have no assurance of your salvation. There's this, almost this sick comfort that comes from you know, always being a victim instead of being a victor. Christ. But God, from the very beginning, even from the Old Testament, he said his promises to his people, which began with Israel, but God promised Abraham that it was through his seed, even through Israel, that eventually God would bless all of the nations of the earth. So when you read the Old Testament and you see the promises that God had for the nation of Israel, yes, those were real promises to a real people in a real time and context, but now through Messiah, through his death and resurrection, those promises are made available to you and me by grace, not by merit. And so when you see here that he's speaking to the nation of Israel, this is a message that I want for you, dear Ecclesia, dear church. How many of you have heard this verse before from Isaiah chapter 43, verse one? But now says the Lord who created you, Willow Baptist Church, he who formed you, Willow Baptist Church, 
Fear not, for I have redeemed you. If God has redeemed you, have you any reason to fear? He's saying no. I have redeemed you and I have called you by your name. What is your identity now? Is it in your insecurities? Is it in your sin? Is it in what the adversary says about you? No. It is God saying, you are mine. I have sealed you. And look, how how does God seal his people? He seals them with the sign of the covenant that Jesus Christ came to die for you. That is the hope that we have in the Trinity. It is God the Father who loved us from eternity past. God the Son, Jesus Christ, came, lived the perfect life, died for your sin and mine, and rose again on the third day to give us eternal life. And it is God the Holy Spirit, like what Romans says, who has sealed us. He has sealed you and me for the day of redemption. We can have full confidence, not in ourselves, Our confidence is in the Lord who redeemed us. I bless you, dear church, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.